Hello everybody and welcome to this episode of Statistics. In this episode we're going to look at various definitions. So I want to look at these three definitions in particular. A population, a sample and bias. So what's a population? Population is what you're exploring. Let's say we're looking at an election. All the people who can vote in the election is the population and if we want to um, do a survey or a poll of that then we take a sample. So the sample refers to a small subset of the overall population. When we're thinking about samples we really want a representative sample. So we want a sample that represents the overall population. So let's say it's a, it's a survey of the British general election and we want to see how many people will vote Labour, how many people will vote Conservative. If in the overall population 50% will vote Labour and 50% of people will vote Conservative then if we take a sample if the sample had 50-50 as well, that'd be great. Imagine if we picked a sample of just everybody voting Conservative though. Then we'd get an incorrect prediction of the outcome of the election because we think 100% of the people would vote Conservative. So getting a sample that represents the overall population is a very tricky business. When I think about this, the example I always think about is if I was on Grafton Street and I had a clipboard and I had to do a survey there's a wrong way and a right way to pick a sample of the overall population. So I was surveying all Irish people about some topic. This is the wrong way. The wrong way is me with my clipboard walking up to people going, excuse me, do you have a minute? Um, I'm just doing a survey. Uh, I just want to ask some questions. What sounds wrong about that? Well, what's, what's wrong about that is I'm deciding who to go up to. So I'm deciding what, what sample of the population I'm picking. So I'll look at a group over there and go, they look very busy, I won't ask them. I'll look at a group over there and go, mm, they might beat me up, I don't think I'll go over towards them. Then I'll look at a group over here and go, they seem like nice people, I'll go over to the nice people and talk to them. So if I am even unconsciously selecting a specific type of group, only nice people, only people who don't look like they're in a hurry, then I'm only selecting one part of the overall population. So the correct way if I was doing a survey on Grafton Street would be I'd imagine an, a line going across the street and I'd count every 20th person and each 20th person who crossed the line I'd ask them, excuse me, um, have you time to do a survey? So then I'm randomly selecting the people although the means by which I'm doing it is not random, it's every 20th person. The type of person I'm getting is completely random. Could be somebody in a hurry, could be somebody not in a hurry. Could be a man, could be a woman, could be young, could be old, whatever. So I'm not, I've taken that decision out, out of my hands by saying every 20th person. What I'm talking about here is introducing bias. So if, if I'm deciding what, what sample to pick from the population, I am kind of introducing my own selection bias into it. I don't really want to do that, so the more I select samples at random, the less of that sort of bias will be involved in the process. Another term that's interesting to talk about is an outlier. Sometimes when we collect a bunch of data, we have a, a series of figures and then there's one value that's way, way bigger or way, way smaller than all the other numbers. We call that an outlier. It outlies the rest of the values. And I want to think about how we treat outliers. So if there's one number that doesn't fit the pattern, what should we do? Well, really what we should do, first thing first, is check that it is a correct value. Maybe somebody was typing in 50 and they accidentally typed in 500 or 5000 instead. So if that is the case, we need to check with the person who did the measurement. If it was us or somebody else, go back to the original notes and check if that 500 should actually be a 50. If it should be a 50, then we change 500 or 5000 to 50. But importantly, we note that we made the change. If it's not a mistake and it is a legitimate part of the sample, then we really shouldn't take it out of the sample. Um, for certain kinds of modelling, we can remove it and, and model the data and put it back in and, or, or comment that this outlier was removed. But typically, if it represents part of the data set, we should always ensure it's there. Some statisticians think it's okay to remove outliers, others don't. There's a little bit of debate about it. My own feeling is, if it's a legitimate data point, why wouldn't you keep it in? And if it skews models a little bit, you know, um, this, is, this is the sort of thing that causes 
technical failures in systems because they look at how much things heat or how much things cool and they look at 99.99% of the data points and they leave out the outliers and sometimes you leave out the outliers tragic things occur so it's important I think to keep in outliers I want to think about definitions around the term average now when we use the term average typically what do we mean is if we have five numbers and we add them up and then divide by five that's typically what we mean when we talk about average that's probably an incorrect term though that is technically speaking the mean if we add up if we have five numbers and we add them up and divide by five we're getting the mean of those five values more specifically we're getting the arithmetic mean because we're adding them up and dividing by the number if we were multiplying them we might be getting the geometric mean so the arithmetic mean is quite simple add the numbers up divide by the number of samples um, but that is only one kind of average a different kind of average is called the median so what's the median? The median is if we line up all the numbers together and pick the middle number, that's the median. And it is interesting, there are debates going on about how well paid or how poorly paid Irish workers are at the moment. And people have made the point that the mean salary of Irish workers is about €51,000 a year. The mean, that is to say, if we add up all the numbers and divide by the number of workers, we get 51,000 a year. But the median salary is 32,000 a year. So if we lined up all everybody's salary in Ireland and ordered them by salary, the middle salary is 32,000 a year. So how could it be that the median is 32,000 but the mean is 51,000? Well, the simple reason is because some people make massive, massive salaries, huge salaries, and that's pulling the mean up so much more. So some people have such mega salaries, it pulls that average, that mean, up so much. Whereas the true middle salary, 50% of Irish people are making 30, 32,000 uh, or less a year. That's the real number, whereas the mean gives us it includes those significant outliers, the people who are being paid so much more money. The other interesting average to look at, I think, is the mode. So the mode says, let's lay out the numbers again and what number occurs most frequently. And that can be very useful. Um, sometimes you get data sets where you just want to see what number occurs the most. Or sometimes you get data sets where there are two values that occur the most. If two values occur the most, we call those bimodal data sets, there's two modes in it. And it's interesting to see how the data is shaped around a value. We wouldn't be surprised at all to find one mode or two modes though, because there is a, a tendency towards uh, a, a central value anyway. A, a concept very much allied with the average and the three averages we looked at, the mean, modian, mean mode and median, a concept that's closely allied with that is called the variance. So when we get a mean of a particular value, let's say here we have teacher salaries, and let's say the average teacher salary is €22,000 a year. How, how, how much do individual teachers vary in their salary from that £22,000 a year? Are most people around 22000 Are some people on mega salaries? Some people on very low salaries? Or how does that work? So in this graph what we're showing is seven teachers, uh, teachers three, four and seven are well above the, the average, the mean, they're on 34, looks about 30 and 30, and this, a couple of teachers below, teacher two and five look to be on about 14,000 a year, and teacher one seems to be on 10,000 a year, and there's only one teacher, teacher number five, who's actually making 22,000 a year. So there's a lot of variation between actual real people's salaries and the mean that we're quoting here. If we look at this graph, on the other hand, we can see here that there's less variation between real teacher salaries and the average teacher salary. So as we can see, there are three teachers who make 22,000 a year, a couple who make more than 22, and a couple who make less than 22. And finally, in this graph, 
there is no variance between the average salary, the mean salary, which is 22,000, and everybody's salary in this sample set. So all seven teachers make 22,000 a year, and all seven teachers have a mean of 22,000. So to go back and look at the, the one that has less variance and the one that has most variance, so the one that has significant variance, what that means is individual sample points are very significantly from the overall mean. We'll note that typically there'll be as many sample points above the line as below the, the line so that when we add them up together there is zero difference because that's how we get to the mean value. There is uh, another measure that goes along with the mean, the variance, we calculate the variance in a quite a simple way. What we do is take each sample point and subtract it from the average. So we take each sample point and subtract it from the average and then we square that value. And we divide that by the number of values we selected, so that's the number n. For reasons I don't want to get into here, but I'll explain in a later video, we, we, do, we don't divide by n, we divide by n minus 1 when we're calculating the variance. It's for um, specific reasons. Uh, a, a nicely related concept to the idea of variance is standard deviation. So if we get the square root of the variance, so that's the square root of the sum of the differences between each point and the average divided by n minus 1, we get what's called rho or the standard deviation. The standard deviation is a measure that allows us, that simply tells us roughly how much variable variation is there between the averages and each individual point. If there's a high standard deviation, then they say, we say there's a big variance between the data points. If there's a low standard deviation, we say that the mean is a very good representation, a good model of the overall data set. Back to this gentleman, Carl Pearson, we mentioned him before. He was born in Islington in the United Kingdom. Um, he's considered by many the father of mathematical statistics, um, taught by uh, Francis Galton, who was a, a significant mathematician himself. Carl Pearson created things like p-values, as we mentioned, Pearson correlation, coefficient, chi distance and chi-squared analysis, the method of moments, things like principal component analysis and therefore indirectly factor analysis. But interesting enough, he actually introduced the term standard deviation, the square root of the sum of the differences between average and individual points divided by n minus 1 um, in 1893. And there were terms and concepts related beforehand, the root mean square error or the mean error or things like that. But he locked down this idea of standard deviation to tell us how good of a model our mean is for the overall data set. So if the standard deviation is high, the mean doesn't really represent many of the data points, or if the standard deviation is low, it, it, it's a good representation of all the values. We'll talk about Pearson and his family again in later videos. I want to finish this video with, with a, a little exercise. So I, I'm going to give you some numbers and I want you to calculate the mean and variance of them, and standard deviation as well. So here are the numbers. It's 36, 41, 43, 44 and 46. So how do we calculate the mean and variance? So if you wouldn't mind pausing this for a moment and then I'll tell you the answer after the pause. Okay, I'm assuming you've paused this. So we calculate the mean quite simply. We add up all the numbers. Uh, 36 plus 41 plus 43 plus 44 plus 46 we get 210 and then we divide by 5 which is the number of numbers so our answer to the mean is the answer to life the universe and everything it's 42 of course the variance we calculate by taking that number 42 and subtracting each individual point from 42 so we subtract 36 from 42 we subtract 41 from 42 43 from 42 44 from 42 and 46 from 42. We get all those differences and then we square them. We multiply them by themselves. 36, 1, 1, 4 and 16 and then we add up and we get 58. To get the variance, it's the sum of this square difference divided by n minus 1. So n is 5, in this case there's 5 values. n minus 1 therefore is 4. So we divide 58 by 4 and we end up with 14.5. 
So we say there's a variance of 14.5 in the data. That's not as helpful as if we get the square root of that value. By getting the square root of 14.5, we're getting what's called the standard deviation. So deviation is 3.8, the square root of 14.5. What does 3.8 tell us? What it tells us is, if our mean is 42, and plus 3.8 gives it, brings it up to 45.8, minus 3.8 brings it down to 39.2. What it means is the values will be somewhere in there between 39.2 and 45.8. Most of the values will be there, thereabouts, within that ballpark. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, well then we'll see you on the next video. Thank you very much.